Hello, and welcome back to the sixth session in our extended reality lecture series, where we'll continue our talk regarding the aspect of material light interaction, but this time cover how to transcribe the behavior with mathematics and what are the most important factors that govern the entire rendering process. When covering the topic of light, one of the most important features is radiance, which gives us the ability to measure light. More specifically, radiance measures the intensity of light along a single ray and is spectrally variant. Now, we can use the term scene radiance to establish a relationship between the brightness of a point in the scene and its brightness in the image by observing this simple scene representation. In it, the light ray reaches a certain point on the surface and produces a radiance in the direction of the camera. So coming back to this image, we can observe that the light ray hitting a surface of an image can create a diffuse or a specular behavior. However, this behavior was examined back in 1977 in this book, Geometrical Considerations and Nomenclature for Reflectance, introducing a term called BRDF. The book states that the interaction of light with the surface can be expressed as a single function called the bidirectional reflectance distribution function or BRDF for short. But what are the most important factors to take into consideration for BRDF? Before we answer this, we can take a look at this term and denote that it is a function, which means that it has to have some input. In this case, the input is the light ray and the viewing ray, which means two directions, which is why it is bidirectional. Reflectance tells us that we are observing how one direction changes to the other, which is when we include the surface normal and the zenith and azimuth angles. The zenith angle just measures the angle between the respective rays and the surface normal, while the azimuth measures the angle between the ray projection onto the surface this plane and a vector in it. With each angle possessing both angles, we have a 4D function. A simple case of observing BRDFs can be seen in this example with an isotropic and unisotropic reflectance within different materials. Isotropic materials have something that is called a rotationally symmetric reflectance, which means that however you rotate the material in reference to the light, the reflection does not change because all the surface imperfections are random. However, with Unisotropic reflections, the surface imperfections have a dominant groove, usually made when machining parts. That basically looks like this, a multitude of cylindrical surfaces that reflect the light differently when we rotate the object. More precisely, when we illuminate the geometry with a spotlight, we get a stretched reflection instead of a single point highlight. This phenomenon is most prominently visible when observing street lights reflected in a watery surface. Now, going back to the isotropic reflections, there is something important to take into consideration, which is the specular highlight intensity. For example, in earlier models, the specular highlights keeps the same intensity as it covers more area. However, a more realistic behavior is for the specular highlight to decrease its intensity as it covers a larger area. This is where we have to include the concept of the conservation of energy or Lambert's law. Lambert's law of absorption states that equal parts in the same absorbing medium absorb equal fractions of the light that enters them. This concept was introduced back in 1977, basically stating that the amount of energy that the light ray carries is equally distributed in all directions upon hitting a surface. This led to this type of reflection model for incoming light rays. But alongside this Lambertian model, Fong introduced a new concept in 1975's paper, which stated that the Fong model has two parts, one for diffuse and one for the specular reflection. Some portion of the light is distributed equally in all directions, which is the diffuse part. This part is independent on the light and viewing ray. The remaining portion of the light is reflected in the direction of the viewing ray, which is called specular. Now, the question is how to compute the surface color and intensity of light reflected from the light source. In order to reduce computation times, we can implement the ambient color, which is low intensity and applied to the entire surface uniformly, disregarding light sources. For the diffuse part, it is assumed that all rays scatter equally in all directions upon hitting the surface, which means that the viewing direction is disregarded. Full intensity is given when the light ray is hitting the surface along the surface normal and is reduced as the angle between the light ray and the surface normal decreases. The specular part takes into consideration the camera position or the viewing ray and produces brighter highlights if the reflected light ray is aligned with the viewing ray. However, the notion of using ambient color to fake the light bouncing off in space has the issue of the materials not behaving uniformly in different surroundings. 
The diffuse reflect and refract workflow solves the issue of assigning proper color and intensity since it uses ray tracing. However, for real-time rendering, it can become computationally heavy. Regardless, the material does not look realistic because physically-based shading is not taken into consideration. So in 2012, Wreck-It Ralph was released following a new workflow that considered real-life light behavior in conjunction to material reflection distribution. As was presented by Brent Burley in front of the Disney Animation Studios, for subsequent films, we wanted to increase the richness of all the materials while making light responses more consistent between materials and environments, and also wanted to improve artist productivity through the use of simplified controls. The main contributor to the success of physically-based shading was the GGX microgeometry theory, which was introduced back in 2007 in this paper. Previously, the Fong Blin model was used since it was not computationally heavy, but with better hardware nowadays, the attention has shifted to PBR. This PBR approach was made available by user-friendly interface where the metalness is set to either 0 or 1 and the roughness is placed from 0 to 1 depending on how scattering the material surface is. This causes the reflectance to be a bit different, which can be observed by a distinct halo around the highlight. So to sum up the BRDF, we have a light ray that is shown here on the right and the viewing ray that is shown on the left. In the middle, we have the two reflection behaviors in reference to the surface normal. The first is the diffuse component that is connected to the Lambertian model, while the other is the specular component that is related to the Blinfong model and the GGX. We have shown the PBR approach, which is called the metalness roughness workflow, but sometimes the roughness component can be defined as smoothness, which describes the same property of light reflection, but with inverse values. If something has a value of one for being rough, it has a value of zero for being smooth. Regardless of the name, this influences the size and intensity of the specular highlight with more porous and irregular surfaces producing a larger but weaker highlight and smoother and shinier surfaces producing a smaller but a more intense highlight. So with regards to the different models we've introduced, we can take a look at the concept that governed the PBR approach, which are the energy conservation, the importance of the viewing direction or viewing ray in reference to the color and intensity of the fuse and specular material components, and the microgeometry theory, which states that the surface is not flat, but has surface irregularities called microfacets that are smaller than a pixel, but overall contribute to the realistic depiction of the material. When talking about microfacets, we have to introduce the concept of a half vector H, which is a vector that is exactly at half an angle between the light ray and the viewing ray. When calculating reflections, we are mostly concerned with the microfacets, which have a surface normal vector aligned to the half vector, because these microfacets will ensure that the light will bounce into the viewing ray and reach our eye, while the others are scattered elsewhere. These types of behaviors have to be taken into consideration for the BRDF function as well, which is mathematically described as such. We will not go deeper into this, but it's important to note that alongside the light and the viewing ray, we now have to include the half vector as well. Let's start with this part of the function, which is called the Fresnel reflection. Fresnel reflection uh, represents the fraction of the incoming light that is reflected as opposed to refracted from an optically flat surface of a given substance at a given light angle. The Fresnel reflection basically tells us which percentage of light is being reflected off them. You can graph this behavior as a function of the angle of incidence, which is the angle between the light ray or the viewing ray and the surface normal. Here we can observe that as the angle of incidence is smaller, meaning we are observing the object close to perpendicularly to the surface, we are not seeing a large amount of reflectance except for its base reflectance, which is different for different materials. You can even see here that some materials like copper and aluminum have different graphs for different RGB colors. In practice, this graph can be depicted like this, where the black color shows small reflectance and the white color shows larger reflectance. The gradient between the black and the white is not linear. As the graphs show, there are three types of behavior. The first one where the reflectance barely changes, which is to say the material only has its base reflectance. This behavior changes for the angle of incidence around 45 degrees, where it changes somewhat and then at around 75 degrees, it changes rapidly reaching one and the angle of 90 degrees. We can observe these three types of behaviors here. Now, the base reflectance is what's called the surface's characteristic specular color as well. 
which can be seen in this coffee cup, where if we look directly into the cup, we have a certain amount of reflection, which increases as the angle of incidence increases. We can observe this phenomenon all around us, where water is the most prominent example, showing what is underneath the surface of the pond when the angle of incidence is small and reflecting what is above when the angle is larger. Now that we've understood the Fresnel contribution to the BRDF, we can divert our attention to the next component, which is the normal distribution function. It is evaluated for the direction of the half normal. So out of all the micro facets, we are interested to see how many of them are facing in the right direction, which is to say how many micro facet surface normals and their vectors are aligned to the half vector. So this component contributes to the intensity and look of the highlight, whether they will have this Gaussian appearance like in Blin Fong, or like in the example of GGX, where the highlight is spiky and has a long tail, which is also called a haze or a halo. This component is self-explanatory, so we can move to the last component, which is the geometry or the shattering masking function. So if D function tells us the amount of micro facets that are pointed in the right direction and F tells us how reflective they are, G tells us of those properly oriented micro facets, how many are masked or shadowed by other micro facets. So they actually reflect the light right into the viewing ray. So during the reflection process, due to surface imperfections, some light rays cannot reach those properly oriented micro facets, while the other light rays reflect but do not reach our eye. The light rays that do not reach these micro facets are then shadowed, while the light rays that are reflected into a viewing ray and are blocked by other micro facets are masked. So with these three important factors accounted for, we can say that we are familiar with the texture mapping and the BRDF aspects, which are presented as being the most essential components of proper lighting conditions. Now we can use this knowledge to construct a metalness roughness approach or a specular glossiness approach where the primary channels deal with the base color and different forms of BRDF and reflectance while also including additional components such as the AO, normal and height ma maps that further influence the surface normals without modeling. Quixel Megascans is a part of Unreal Engine and already offers PBR materials that follow this logic and theory. However, if you want to make materials for yourselves, you can always visit these websites that offer high quality images to be used as textures in the material generation process. Now, the real question remains, is it better to produce the textured images by taking photographs or by generating them procedurally? What is better when it comes to making material variations as opposed to computational times and manual labor? You can write your thoughts in the comments below. In the next video, we will cover the topic of light in the rendering pipeline, starting with the terminology and historic overview. I thank you for your time and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.